Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Well, you know, re- right after hockey games, my mood is often dictated by what happened in the game, and I'm kind mm-hmm. of very... I'm, I'm gratified, Bruce, because I thought this was a good Edmonton Oilers team heading into the season. Mm-hmm. I thought it could be a team that could compete for the first overall in their division. Mm-hmm. And finally, we're seeing that team. And we saw that team in tonight's 3 nothing win over the Habs against a Montreal team that absolutely dominated them in the first two games. And it just had me really wow. worried, honestly, those first two games against Montreal. But Edmonton was the better team in the four games against Toronto, even though it was 2-2, uh, two and two, right? I thought Edmonton was the better team overall. And... Um, they were sure better than the Montreal Canadiens tonight, Bruce. 17 grade H chances for the Oilers and just seven for the Habs. And four of those Hab chances came at in garbage time. And none of them were particularly five alarm grade H chances. You know, they were tips at the net and, you know, good shots in tight. But there was none that was of the last chances, at least. So just a great game by the Edmonton Oilers, their best game of the year, I think, quite easily. Well, it was certainly their best 60-minute effort of the year, and it was uh, three one nothing periods for the Oilers. I mean, hard to do better than that on a, in a road game. Tend to, you know, win all three periods and, and uh, you know, pretty much deservedly shut out the other guys. I mean, Montreal had that great early chance on the breakaway, and then... Uh, uh, Edmonton had, by our count, the next 14 in a row, 15 in a row. <laughs> yeah. And then the Habs got a couple late in the second, and then the Oilers responded mm-hmm. with a power play goal early in the third. And uh, from then on, it was just a matter of mining the store and bend but not break. And What was the uh, what was the shot clock today? What was the shot? Uh, it was pro-Montreal by 38 to 31. So this is a game that really demonstrates that shots – Shot statistics can be misleading in a game. And this is actually why one of the reasons Roger Nielsen invented, you know, looking at scoring chances like he did, because he's, he realized that shots don't tell the story of a game, that it's scoring chances that do. And, mm-hmm. and that's when he started to dig into them and create this system, which uh, that we've adopted. They were uh, shooting but, from everywhere after they got behind. So, of course, score effects yeah. had something to do with it because the halves were behind on the scoreboard from what, the uh, 8.27 mark of the first period till the bitter end, and that, that often drives the play. You know, it's, it's like, uh, it, it's one of those stats that some nights it tells you a lot, and other nights it just yeah. tells you who was behind all night. And it's like, fo- <laughs> it's like football. I, I, I often find myself making <clears throat> comparisons between hockey and football. Football yards is a, kind of the equivalent to shots on goal or coursey events, where the team gains the most yards is supposedly the better team. But if the, one team is up behind by 20 points and the other team is letting them pass the ball from one 20 yard line to the other, and then they're tightening up and, and, you know, closing them down closer to the goal line, all those yard, all those yards do is kill time off the clock, which is what the team with the lead wants. So you can often see, you know, a quarterback with 428 yards passing, but his team is, you know, on the short end of a, of a of a significantly high scoring game, in this case low scoring game, but uh, the Oilers didn't give up that many dangerous shots, and uh, the ones they did give up, the uh, Mike Smith had the answers for. So Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast, and because it's a big Oilers win, we're going to go with two good things each. What is your first good thing? Well, I'm going to give a tip of the hat to the old gray beard Mike Smith. 38-year-old goalie coming back from uh, an injury in the uh, second game of the season, uh, uh, a clean sheet, 38-save shutout for the 40th shutout of his career. That's a nice number, shutouts. That's a good career for any goalie, 40 shutouts. And uh, he was just, I, I, I liked his game, solid. Uh, he made uh, made the one huge save early on the, on the breakaway by Suzuki. And then afterwards, he was just, Big, you know, he was filling the net. He was kind of swallowing up the rebounds. His puck handling was good. Uh, you know, his take charge attitude back there. I think that helps the Oilers. I mean, they oh, yeah. they play tighter, 
and uh, you know he he he. I think he might have had one or two slight misadventures with the puck, but nothing that you know really resulted in anything serious. And uh, just had the had the uh, answers throughout. Like for all the shots he faced, he wasn't seriously tested. But uh, you know, seven grade A chances would be the serious tests, and uh, he he solved all of those. But uh, some of those shots, outer outside shots, were still pretty good one timers. Montreal had a few in the early going where they were setting up a one timer from you know above the ringette line, but you know a bomb shot that was on goal and. You know, easily one of them could have gone in, but nope. And so uh, Smith now, he's played two games, David, and he's given in one goal, and it was scored by Adam Larson. <laughs> he's uh, he's shutting up his critics. There, right? he, he's shutting up his critics, Bruce. Well, maybe he's, not. He's, he's shutting out his opponents. I don't know if he's shutting up the critics, but he's shutting out his <laughs> opponents to this point. And if it wasn't for that Adam Larson, you know, I mean, he'd have a 1,000 save percentage. And of course, this, this is a Canadian hockey uh, Canadian hockey city is where critics are in his own hometown, of course, um, with the Oilers fans. Away. Yeah, that is the way of the Canadian hockey fan, and we're including me. Like uh, I'm, I'm as guilty. Well, he's up and down. When not, he's down, we're down on him, and that's how it should be. I, I, what I don't get is being down on him all the time because he's not down all the time, and when he's on his game, he's pretty good. When he's healthy, Bruce. When mm-hmm. he's healthy, he can play. And come on, he was so critical to that game because of the first save. You know, they no, get a it was away. huge. They get a breakaway, and that's the kind of thing. Much everything gets behind one nothing, and it just changes the game completely. But he made that big save early in the game, and that's everything in in hockey. You know, that it's just such a huge moment. If a, if a goalie lets in a in a weak goal early in the game, it, I just find it. You see, it's so deflating for a team, and, and it's the, the reverse is true. Uh, Bruce, my first good thing will be the what, I, what I'm referring to as the nitty-gritty dirt line. And that's the new line of um, Jujar Kara, Tyler Ennis, and the NHL's smallest enforcer, Josh Archibald, <laughs> who, who, who does his enforcing not with his fists, but with his hits, because he hurts when he hits. But Bruce Lee, that that passing play, that passing play was, that was Red Army, nineteen eighty seven, KLM line quality passing. That was as nice a passing play as probably those three players, or at least two of them. Ennis has always been involved in skill plays, but I, I bet you, I bet you Archibald and Kara can count on one hand the time they've been on nicer passing plays in the NHL level than that one. That was a spectacular one with. Uh, with um, uh, Archibald, I think it was Archibald uh, finding uh, first Ennis hitting the long bomb to Archibald. The wall pass that the beat the defenseman. Pass. The defenseman went for the puck on the side, and because he banked it off the wall, they couldn't get it, and Archibald got free behind him for the two on one. And then that sweet cross scene pass to Kara, and he finished it off with just a fantastic sweet strike shot. <laughs> oh, was it ever? And so, uh, but they all night long, they were, they, they kept it up. They were a thorn in Montreal's side. They were forechecking and pl- it's just fantastic to, to see Jujar Kara be the player that we all thought he might be coming out of the AHL mm-hmm. or p- at least people who watched him in the AHL, you know, mm-hmm. just a, a decent third line center in the NHL, good, s- strong in his own zone and confident with the puck making plays. And uh, it's fantastic that he's got his confidence high and is and is going for it so keep it up juju Kara. yeah that was a goal david that that could have been the dynamite line scoring <laughs> that goal right yeah could have been uh could have been uh um dry saddle with that long feed off the wall and yamamoto darting behind the defense and sending it across and nuge banking that shot in off the post and we would have been raving about what a great goal it was by them it was that quality of goal to get yeah. something like that out of the third line that, you know, opens the scoring and ultimately is a, deservedly the game-winning goal. That was clearly the best goal of this game and, and uh, uh, very heartwarming to uh, to see. So so the nitty-gritty dirt line, Bruce, mm-hmm. none of my nicknames for lines seem to stick, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe one the of them. The dynamite line kind of stuck. But that, I took a poll. The dynamite line. Wasn't that's that yours? True. 
Well, it was a poll, right? I, I did an internet oh, okay. poll and asked, there was a couple, there was the, I think there was the dry line versus the dynamite line were the two finalists at the time. And the dynamite line had slightly more. So that was kind of a fan pick and it, and it has stuck somewhat. Um, I, I find it quite handy actually to have a nickname for a line because it's, you know, you don't have to say the, the well, that line or the third line or the, like, it's just a little bit more interesting. All right. Bruce. I'm going to just give you some stats for that line, even though okay. it's not our numbers. Uh, one shot, six hits for Kara, plus nine and nine and six in the face off dot for a nifty 60%. That was Kara. Uh, two shots, three hits, and that great pass by uh, Archibald. And for Ennis, two shots, two hits, and that great wall pass. So they're all playing the physical game. They're all over the puck. And mm. the only complaint I had was uh, Ennis made two or three kind of passes back in the zone that got picked off in the offensive zone. If you're going to get picked off, you better be going forward with it. So you're one of the guys between the puck and your own net. But that was a that was a mild criticism. None of them was too 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 dangerous. But that was one small detail. But uh, they were uh, they were aggressive and all over the puck. And uh, Jujar Kara is a new man, David. Just and Josh Archibald completely different from the guy that started the season. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> and Josh Archibald, Bruce. I'm not haven't been the biggest fan, but I'm becoming the biggest one of them because the way he's playing recently, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. He's he's everything you want in a in a role depth player, killing penalties very effectively again, um, making plays on the attack, super solid defensively, and just hustling like crazy. Yeah, and then the hits. I mean, wow, keep it, on coming. It, it's like a mini Bob Gainey here. All right, uh, mandatory nineteen seventy sports reference. Bruce, your second good thing. Uh, I'm going to give a tip of the hat to one of the sort of under-the-radar guys, uh, William Lagason. I've been watching his game the last little while since he got in the lineup. I think this is five games now that he's been in in a row. And he's been good to excellent in all of the games. Like, he hasn't had a down game yet. And he's uh, he's just, he's making plays. He's, he's, he's battling and he's winning battles. Uh, you know, he was actually the guy on the goal. Uh, one of the reasons that Ennis got the puck so quick and was able to reverse the play on that beautiful goal was Lagesson denying the zone entry where the guy tried to shoot it in and Lagesson got a piece of the shot and went over to the side. And, you know, he's just competing everything. He certainly was competing with, uh, with uh, Josh Anderson. A Montreal forward, and he frustrated the crap out of him to the point where Anderson took two roughing penalties trying to trying to get even with uh, Lagos. And of course, the Oilers scored the three nothing power play goal on that uh, on that uh, extra penalty that he drew that really you know put this game to bed. Once it was three nothing, I was starting to feel pretty safe. I'm nervous with with leads, but I, once it got to three nothing, I was thinking this one looks pretty good. And also that wrist shot. I've been warning you guys about that wrist shot. Did you see the? Did you hear the wrist shot? Ping! What a rocket from the from the center blue line and uh, cleanly beat Jake Allen, who was very good in the Montreal net to my eye. And it was just a just an absolute rocket. And he he's not a slapper guy or a snapper guy. He's a wrist shot guy, but his wrist shot is wicked. And I present to you Exhibit A. That one he rang off the iron from about 55 feet tonight. Of course, he's, he's got a sneaky wrist shot there and a sneaky offensive game because he's not bad with the puck. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he makes good plays. And at the AHL level, he was every bit as good an, an even-strength point scorer as Ethan Bear and Caleb Jones. So, like, there's, I think there's some people in some people's minds, well, how can you play Lagesson over Jones? Like, Jones is the puck mover, but are you sure? Like... I, I can see stylistically, and, and I agree, like Jones is a very smooth and slick player. Bill Lockers can move the puck fairly well, or Wild Bill, as they called him in, in the bake. And mm -hmm. uh, and the, here's the other thing about Lagos and Bruce. He's, he's done a very strong job. So far in limited minutes on the PK, he's gotten the job done. And um, Chris Russell has been okay at even strength this year, but Russell has really struggled on the PK. He has. He's he's made all kinds of um, uh, just a very high rate of major mistakes out there, leading to great A chances and goals against. Very unlike Chris Russell. 
but um, it's a little bit alarming. And it's part of the reason that Oilers, Oilers PK hasn't, hasn't been very good this year. But Lagerson in limited minutes has really got the job done. And uh, segueing to my good thing, Bruce, is that I, I think the Oilers really are at their best when they have at least when they have at least four puck moving defensemen in the lineup. And that means playing. That means you can't have Russell Lagerson and Larson at the same time. That's not the best mix on the Edmonton Oilers. You're not playing a team that's going to be optimal on the attack. And tonight we saw an Oilers team that was optimal both on defense and on the attack. And I think one of the major differences is it's not just uh, breaking the puck out of their own zone. It's when the Oilers have the puck in the offensive zone, the reason their cycles are more dangerous in the end and more longer overall is when they put the puck back to the point now, it's not some dump in behind the net that that's a 50 50 puck or a weak shot on net which does nothing or gets blocked uh, which is which has been the case for about a decade with the orders when they're cycling the puck suddenly you put it back to bouchard and you're going to get a great shot probably or a very in, s- solid pass you put it back to tyson berry you know, and Tyson Berry's always creeping into the slot. He did a couple times tonight for grade A scoring chances. You put it back to Lagos and something's probably good good is going to happen because he's not, I mean, he's he's not as creative as these other guys with the puck, but he can get a good shot off and he can make a decent pass. So I just I just really love the way that the Oilers were passing the puck tonight. And I give credit to the these new defensemen who have been injected into the lineup. Well, that's a good D-to-D D passing along the blue line, too. Like, they work it back to one point, and the guy had one touch it right inside the line, not pass it out of the zone like we've seen too often in the past. And and uh, uh, I saw a few of those passes from uh, Lagason tonight. And uh, just, just to briefly finish what we were talking about a minute ago in, in uh, uh, Bakersfield, Lagason, 27 points in 67 games his first year, plus 25. Every single one of his points was at even strength. Like he never played the power play, and he scored like 0.4 per game. And those are points that will translate more than a guy that's you know a power play specialist, and he comes up and he gets buried on the third pairing. But he, he scored at even strength last year: 10 points in 25 games, and a plus two on a on a real bad team. And now with the Oilers, two points in seven games and a plus uh, plus three so far, and you know winning his part of the game and get, and getting points. Like, you know, he's he's not a, a gifted scorer, but he gets the puck into good places and sometimes good things happen. Yeah, and, and among those defensemen that were playing tonight was Slater Cuckoo, who also was uh, strong. He's a strong puck mover. So they've they've really done a good job. Lockerson in Sweden this year was leading their, <laughs> running the power play. Of course, that was, he the was yeah, second division. Bruce, seven of the Oilers' 17 grade A shots tonight were from the defensemen. Uh, so that's, again, it's just a different team when you get that kind of contribution defensively. And it, the Oilers can keep this up, but I don't see why they can't. It makes them a very strong team in this division. I don't think this is, this is where it ends for the Oilers like in terms of peaking. The mm-hmm. Oilers are finally getting rolling here. This is the team I expected to see this year, and I expected to see in the playoffs. So f- unbelievably frustrating that we didn't see that, but finally we're starting to see it. And uh, I, I expect it to carry on. This is a good hockey team. Three What's one, bat- three two, three nothing. Yeah. Back to back to back road wins. Three goals was enough in all three games after that six four debacle in Calgary that started it. But your Dave Tippett's a happy man tonight. Yeah. You know, even when they were losing, of course, early in the year, we made this point a few times on the podcast, they were out-chancing the other team in terms of grade-A chances consistently. There was only a few games where they didn't. So, But they weren't getting the goaltending, and they and they, right. they have been getting it. Bruce, what's your um, bad thing tonight? Well, this is the one thing that won't make Dave mm. Tippett a happy man, and this is, of course, the, the uh, unfortunate situation involving Nessa Pugliarvi, who was... Um, uh, Missed practice this morning, and uh, right away my spidey sense kind of went, oh, I don't like this missing practice, and they asked Tippett about it, and he was kind of evasive and said, well, I like the Montreal guy, and not asked him directly, is this, you know, is it an injury or is it something else? And uh, Tippett said, because earlier in Edmonton, 
sportscaster to ask him without asking for specifics. And Tippett said, I told you what I'm going to tell you. But then he did go on and say, I, all I know is the trainers told me that we should hold him out of the morning workout and we'd have a better idea uh, this afternoon. He'll be a game time decision. And mm-hmm. holding him out and, uh, you know, uh, not being an obvious injury, though he did get drilled in the back last game by, uh, by Zaitsev of uh, Ottawa. Uh, but, uh, uh, and sure enough, this afternoon, the word came down that uh, um, Ann Euler had tested positive and it was pretty easy to connect those dots. And about an hour later, they confirmed it was Paul Yarvey. Tested, had tested positive, Bruce? Uh, was put yeah, into that the was COVID my understanding. Protocol. He'd gone into COVID protocol. My understanding is he took a second test and it came back negative. And now he still doesn't get to fly home with the team, but he has to, get, he has to pass two more tests. Uh, I have to come up negative before he's allowed to return. And hopefully it's uh, one of those little glitches that uh, it's a weird test or something. Well, it's uh, a very sensitive test, right? Yeah. Like and he was, yeah, he was playing pro hockey all year in Finland when they would shut down the mm-hmm. league a few times, right? With maybe, uh, who knows? Who knows what it is? Let's and, hopefully it's And then there's, then you're going, well, who's he with, right? And, and Koskinen that he sits with on the flights and stuff, his fellow Finn. He got pulled out of the lineup where he was just going to be the backup goalie, and they called up Dylan Wells uh, from the taxi squad to stand on the bench. And Dylan Wells got a thrill in his first pro game watching an old pro Mike Smith pitch a shutout for his team. Uh, but uh, he didn't have to see action, and that's uh, that's good. And hopefully, especially in Koskinen's case, that's what one of those abundance of caution situations where... I don't want the guy standing around on the bench breathing on everybody if he's just, you know, if he's been hanging around the uh, the other guy that had a testing issue. And uh, Koskinen was due the night off anyway. You might as well put your feet up after those 40 saves he made in Ottawa and all those games he played earlier. So uh, he got a true rest tonight and, and, uh, uh, and Smith carried the mail. But when I heard the second guy was being pulled, I, I was really starting to go, uh-oh. But uh, they, and they delayed the game an hour, which is a very rare thing. Uh, and but whatever it was, it didn't seem to uh, uh, crimp the team's style. If anything, they came out with more jump in their step than uh, uh, than we've seen in a while. Yeah. So the three meter man got to lay back in his two and a half meter bed and watch <laughs> the game from his hotel room. Anyway, um, my 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 wishes do go out to Yesapul Yarvi. It's going to be yeah. real. Dragged to be left in Montreal on your own in quarantine while the team. Well, Koskinen will be there home. too, won't he? And, and well, I, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. We'll, we will hear more. And the team, I thought they did miss Paul Yarby. I thought James Neal looked a little slow and behind the play, mm-hmm. although he did get a couple of a couple of shots later on in the game that McDavid set him up for. But uh, he, uh, uh, he, his legs aren't aren't what they used to be, you know. And the spirit is willing. Help. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't want to but, dump uh, on him, but I just, you know, it was a step down in terms of the of the speed and skill of that uh, of that first line. Yeah, and it was Kyle Torres' best game, I thought, of the year, too. He mm-hmm. was in on a couple of great A chances. He set up a chase on on a breakaway, so good for Kyle Torres there. But I'm going to pick on someone else from his line as the bad thing. Right. <laughs> that was Devin Shore. Um the breakaway early in the game, I, I, we both agreed, was entirely on shore because he dumps the puck in and gets picked off. And immediately the, the player that's right beside him breaks up the ice and shore doesn't break with him to cover it off. So he's both a turnover and a fail to cover. And there wasn't, there wasn't a chance for the two defensemen out there to recover from a turnover. When you get a bad turnover in hockey, mm-hmm. it's punished quickly. And often it's the only major mistake on a on a breakaway or a goal against or a grade A chance against, and this is this was on Shore, and I find Shore to be um, uh, very hustling. He hustles hard. He works hard. He's got some speed. He's got a good shot. Um, his def- I, I'm not sure about his defensive hockey IQ uh, overall, Bruce. So we'll see how that develops. He's had some good games. He's 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 been involved in some good line play. So, but that was one play where he really needed to cover that breaking player, and he failed to do so. Yeah, usually when there's a guy gets behind for a breakaway, like what happened with uh, Dodonov on Monday night, where <clears throat> you know we find a defense, whatever side defenseman he got behind, we're going to dump on that guy. But in this case, 
the two defensemen were on either boards because Shore was in the middle of the ice at the center point and he had lots of options and they were kind of in the umbrella to the two sides. And when he went right up the middle and it got picked off like that, they had no no time to recover and it was on him to to turn and pick up the the breaking guy, Suzuki, and that was a mismatch. And thankfully, Smith had the answer because it was uh, really the one real serious breakdown that the Oilers had in the game where, you know, it was an A-plus chance. Yeah. So. Shore's first mistake on that play came earlier, actually, in the sequence. He had a wide open Evan Bouchard at the point. Gentlemen of the Edmonton Oilers, when you have a wide open, I know he's just a rookie, He's just a few games in his career. But when you have a wide open Evan Bouchard at the point, pass him the puck. That's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. And Shore didn't. He kept the puck, and then he walked the line. He, he walked the line essentially turning himself into a defenseman. And, that, and so if you're going right. to be the defenseman, play, defense. play like one. Play like one. <laughs> so anyway. Evan Bruce, Bouchard, man, I'm getting excited when, uh, when yeah. the puck's on his stick. Because yeah. you know good things are going to happen, those breakout passes, you know, like not 100% of them, but the vast majority of them are good and on target and and, and get, hit the guy in stride. And there was one little one tonight I just loved. It was just a single one touch where it, came, it looked like it was almost a 50-50 puck where Bouchard had to, had to kind of reach out to get to it first, and he just one touch chipped it up the middle, right on the tape, and the orders were going the other way. It was speed. It was maybe a 15-foot pass, but it was just precision. And just such a deft, deft pass. I love deft passes. <laughs> I'd love to see him out there, Bruce, at even strength with mm-hmm. um, either the David line or the dry subtle line. I think he could do a lot of damage with working in concert with those two guys. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And if I'm completely honest, I'd like to see him on the power play, get a turn on the power play. Um, the power play is a, we did get a power play goal, so I can't complain about Tyson. Why the, why the too point, much. It was a hell of a shot. <laughs> so I, but nonetheless, I'd like to see Evan Bouchard get, he is out there on the power play, you know, he's playing the last Second unit. Yep. 20, 30 seconds. So Bruce, what's your number? Oh yeah. My number has to do with ice time by the forwards. And how this changed from the beginning of the road trip when McDavid played 28-16 and McDryside played 27-03 and they had several forwards in single digits. Well, tonight the range was 11 minutes and 29 seconds for your man Devin Shore. That was the least, 11 minutes and 29 seconds. And the most was Ryan Nugent Hopkins at 19 minutes, 13 seconds. First game all year where the Oilers didn't have a single forward with 20 minutes. And... It was. I mean, there wasn't a lot of special teams, so that that tends to narrow the gap. And it wasn't like a super tight game, or it wasn't the Oilers trying to come from behind. And and Tippett was able to roll the lines, and he did. And it was. I mean, Drysaddle tonight, and Drysaddle. I thought he had a tough uh, couple of games after uh, after the the big effort in, in Calgary in the first game in Ottawa. Seventeen oh six, a season low for Drysaddle. Like he's usually twenty two, twenty three minutes and uh, and he was I, I didn't think he was great tonight but he was uh, you know uh, I think he was better with 17 minutes than he would have been with 23 and so uh, to me it's an encouraging sign that they had four lines that they could trust and the, and the uh, the Kara Archibald uh, Ennis line they all got 13 minutes and basically they were the third line and uh, a very very good third line indeed the last uh uh, the last few games. My uh, number is seven. It's actually two sevens. And that's the seven shots on net that Connor McDavid had. And he was also a major contributor to seven grade A chances. I just thought he had a fantastic game. Even mm-hmm. though he only had the one assist, he could have easily had two or three points tonight. He was just flying out there and, and so sharp with the puck. Just, you know, the yeah. old Howie Meeker phrase, stick handling in the phone booth around, <laughs> to get around players and set up Tyson Berry on one play. And it was just constant, the, the fine control that he had with the mm-hmm. puck and moving it around and rushing, attacking, moving. He looked determined to put up a, a multi-point game. It, that eluded him, but he still had, a, I thought, a great game. And he, he's such he a fantastic a- an assist they took away an assist from him when he, he did make a very nice play to set up Darnell Nurse. 
Yeah. Uh, but I was kind of shocked when originally they awarded two assists on that goal because Nurse was, I think, about the fourth last guy to touch the puck when he shot it because Shea Weber went to clear the rebound and he whacked it off of Sherratt, I think it was, and it was, uh, while well, the goalie saved it first, of course, he was shot by Nurse, and then Weber whacked it, and then hit Sherratt, and then Weber whacked it. It was going wide, and Weber whacked it a second time and knocked it inside the post, and then he whacked it a third time, but by then it was about one inch over the goal line. I mean, <laughs> Weber had to be beside himself after, after oh, that. Oh, God, season. that was so sweet, Bruce. It's a very, very... Uh, very fortuitous string of bounces from an Oilers perspective. And Darnell Nurse, I mean, he's now tied for the league lead with Jeff Petrie with, uh, with because uh, I don't think he scored tonight. And it was six goals each. But I think of the six, three of Darnell's have had a lot of sort of good fortune about him. Yeah. yeah. The one that went through the five hole the other night, any self-respecting NHL goalie turns that aside. And he had one. It's the same Ottawa goalie, actually. It was a long point shot that got deflected in the high slot, and the goalie overplayed it, and it beat him in the short side. And just, you know, uh, and the other three were, like, good shots from in close. Like, he, you know, he's he's a definitely an offensive force, but six goals is a little bit out of character, and I think it's just, a, you know, to some extent, he's got good fortune, and he's certainly got some on that goal. Though he did make the rush, and he got a good shot away, and the goalie made a good stop, but then everything went sideways from a, yeah, it was a bit of a panic play by Montreal because it was such a good shot, right? And a mm-hmm. dangerous chance. Yeah. So that's that that led to the panicky response from Montreal. But I don't think I've ever seen a goal that that was that odd, that that bounced off so many people before going in, including including Weber twice. twice. I mean, that was just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've all seen a guy hammer the puck yeah. off the goal and it hits somebody else and goes in. Mm-hmm. But then yep. to hammer it, hit someone else, and then then you put it in <laughs> on your own. And even when Adam Larson scored oh, the other night, he didn't score on his own rebound, right? I mean, he, yeah. it was just one mistake, and it was just a costly All right, one. Hi, Bruce. Let That's a, a moratorium on the Adam okay. Larson score. All right. Let's change, let's change the subject, David. We've both been watching the Montreal Canadiens for a whole lot of years. How did you like the, the blue uh, unis with the red stripe in the middle? The reverse uh, retro. Something so special um, about just the Montreal Canadiens crest, mm-hmm. their overall uni- uniform design, and mm-hmm. the blue. So the blue was. I understand that they actually wore that blue in the past, if I'm not mistaken. I in the 30s or 40s, I heard that that's a bit of a retro jersey. They're calling um, them know. reverse retros, whether they are or not. They're, what they mean by reverse is they reverse the primary colors. Oh, I like see. the Oilers reverse the orange and the blue when they came out with that uh, yeah. that, uh, that orange, orange and white look that one game. But I've never seen a Montreal. I've seen some funky white jerseys from Montreal, uh-huh. uh, and some with multiple stripes. But that the blue with, or the red with the blue blue stripe with the two thin white stripes that. It's been there's been no other team that's ever tried to duplicate that. I don't think in the league, like the the layout of the striping, but to reverse it like that, I thought it looked great. I, I was, it was. I liked uh, it. I liked yeah. it. I liked that. The Montreal uniform is the mm-hmm. best uniform in the world. If mm-hmm. I was a Habs fan growing up, so um, mm-hmm. I just I got a lot of fond memories of the 1970 Montreal Canadiens, and that is just a f- classic, fantastic hockey sweater. And the blue looked great. I agree, Bruce. Now the reverse really worked for them. Yeah, I like the Oilers reverse. Mm-hmm. I don't like the Oilers high tech sweaters very much. I have to say, they, they right. kind of the numbers are hard to read. The Leafs high tech sweaters were impossible. Like you couldn't even tell who was who was who out there. But I don't like the Oilers ones very much. But I, I like the Oilers. Um, is that what they are reverse? I'm not. I'm not up reverse on the market. Reverse retros. They're calling the, the new tech. fourth jerseys. All right. Well, I. Good for them. I, I like it. I, it. It reminds me of the Oilers WHA kind of look a little bit, and mm-hmm. I, I like that look a lot. So, uh, but yeah, the, the Montreal Canadiens are in a class all their own when it comes to hockey sweaters. And mm-hmm. I mean, who else had a had a piece of a f- fine children's literature written about them? A hockey uh, that hockey sweater. That's mm-hmm. right. We, and that's why we call them sweaters, not jerseys. So I, I when I I coach it, they're sweaters. I always tell the kids, put on your sweaters. Nobody knows what I'm talking about anymore, Bruce. Jerseys, jerseys, jerseys. 
All right, let's leave it there, Bruce. Uh, next game, Winnipeg. Next Monday. It's they got three Monday? more days off now. Yep, yeah, they got to. They they crunched these four games in six days with a three game layoff beforehand and another three eight day layoff afterwards. But the games were crunched together, and I, I was worried the Oilers would be really on an energy deficit tonight. But uh, it seemed to affect Montreal more playing the back to back than it did Edmonton playing the four and six. So anyway, now they got a little bit of time to rest up and hopefully uh, uh, long enough for uh, JP to get cleared and sent home and line up on the first line again on Monday night when they host the Jets. They have back-to-back at home against Winnipeg. And then they play uh, Friday, Saturday next week against Calgary. One here, one there. Yeah, let's uh, let's hope this isn't COVID for Pulia Yarvi, Bruce. Let's hope this isn't that. We know that most young people who get it are perfectly okay. But in the odd case, they're not. Mm -hmm. And Marco Rossi... From the Ottawa Senators, the first round draft pick of the Wild, I think, mm-hmm. uh, ninth overall, if I'm not mistaken, he had his season shut down by COVID. I mean, that would yeah. be just terrible. So, I mean, just and whatever, like he, he Rossi doesn't sound like he's in a lot of risk right now, uh, right. but he he was set back. I, like Gaetan Haas is obviously, I, I don't know if this what's going on right now, if this is COVID related or not. It's hard to know, but he was set back for at least a month there. So, uh, fingers Anyhow. crossed on Pulia RV. Thanks, Bruce, for talking. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>